late in the summer of 1811. Tecumseh left the Ohio country for the South to expand his alliances to the Chickasaws, Choctaws, and Creeks, except for a militant Creek faction known as the Red Sticks. These groups wanted no part of Tecumseh's enterprise. Worse, William Henry Harrison used Tecumseh's absence to move against Tecumseh's headquarters at Tippecanoe. Having assembled a ragtag army of 1,000 men, including 350 U.S. regulars, raw Kentucky and Indiana militiamen, and a handful of Delaware and Miami Indian scouts, Harrison attacked outside of Tippecanoe on November 7, 1811. Losses were equally heavy on both sides, about 50 whites and 50 Indians slain. But the battle cost Tecumseh's followers their headquarters and prompted many of them to desert Tecumseh. Thus the settlers of the West had their first taste of a major fight and a significant victory. Of fighting. They were about to get more than their fill during the next three years. Victories, however, would be very few. Warhawks triumphant. The War of 1812 is one of those historical events nobody thinks much about nowadays. But earlier generations of American schoolchildren were taught that it was nothing less than the Second War of Independence. Righteous conflict fought because the British at war with Napoleon and in need of sailors for the Royal Navy insisted on boarding you s vessels to impress American sailors into His Majesty's service. Actually, the U s declared war on Britain on June 1, 9, 1812 three days after the British had agreed to stop. Impressing seamen. The real cause of the war was not to be found on the ocean, but in the Transappalachian West. In Congress, the region was represented by a group of land-hungry war hawks, spearheaded by Representative Henry Clay of Kentucky. The Warhawks saw war with Britain as an opportunity to gain relief from British-backed hostile Indians and as a chance to gain what was then called Spanish Florida, a parcel of land extending from Florida west to the Mississippi River. Spain, which held this land, was allied with Britain against Napoleon. War with Britain, therefore, would mean war with Spain and victory would mean the acquisition of Spanish Florida, which would complete an unbroken territorial link from the Atlantic through the recently purchased Louisiana Territory, clear to the Pacific. The trouble was that President James Madison, elected to his first term in 1808, did not want war. He renewed the diplomatic and economic initiatives Jefferson had introduced. But, facing a tough re-election battle in 181, 2. He at last yielded to Clay and the other. Leading war hawks. John Calhoun of South Carolina and Kentucky's Richard Mentor. Johnson. President Madison asked a willing Congress for a declaration of war three-pronged flop. Since colonial times, Americans shunned large standing armies. Now, having declared war, the country had to fight it with an army of only 12. 000 regular troops scattered over a vast territory. The troops were led by generals most of whom had achieved their rank not through military prowess but through political connections. As to the nation's navy, its officers were generally of a higher caliber. But it was a very puny force. 
especially in comparison with the magnificent fleets of the British. Despite these terrible handicaps, U. S. Planners developed a three-pronged invasion of Canada. A penetration from Lake Champlain to Montreal, another across the Niagara frontier, and a third into Upper Canada from Detroit. The sad fact was that the attacks, thoroughly uncoordinated, all failed. The fall of Detroit. The governor of Michigan Territory. William Hull was nominated to command. The American forces north of the Ohio River. A minor hero of the Revolution. Hull was almost 60 years old when he led his forces across the Detroit River into Canada on July. 12. 1812. His objective was to take Fort Malden, which guarded the entrance to Lake Erie. But Hull believed himself outnumbered and delayed his assault, thereby providing enough time for the highly capable British commander, Major General Isaac Brock, to bring his regulars into position. While this maneuvering was going on, the American garrison at Fort Michilimackinac, guarding the Mackinac Straits between Lake Huron and Lake Michigan, was overrun and surrendered without a fight on July 17. On August 2, Tecumseh chased Hull out of Canada and back to Fort Detroit. Now Brock united his men with Tecumseh's warriors, and Hull surrendered Fort Detroit and some one. 500 men without firing a shot. On August 16, farther south, just the day before Hull surrendered Detroit, Fort Dearborn, at the site of present-day Chicago, surrendered. As troops and settlers evacuated the fort, Potawatomi Indians attacked, killing 35 men, women, and children mainly by torture, defeat on the Niagara frontier. New York Militia General Stephen Van Rensselaer led to 270 militiamen and 900 regulars in an assault on Queenston Heights, Canada, just across the Niagara River. Part of the force, mostly the regulars, got across the river before General Brock having rushed to Queenston from Detroit and pinned them down on October 13. The balance of the militia contingent refused to cross the international boundary and stood by as 600 British regulars and 400 Canadian militiamen overwhelmed their comrades. A no-show in Canada. The principal U.S. force had yet to attack. Major General Henry Dearborn led 5,000 troops, mostly militia, down Lake Champlain and on November 19, was about to cross into Canada. At that point, the militia contingent, asserting its constitutional rights, refused to fight in a foreign country. Dearborn had no choice but to withdraw without seriously engaging the enemy. The West in flames. The collapse of Detroit. Fort Dearborn. And the Canadian campaign laid the West open to Indian assault and British invasion. Suffering along the frontier was acute. Yet neither the British nor their Indian allies were able to capitalize decisively on their advantages. Although most of the Old Northwest soon fell under Indian control, a coordinated British assault on the region, which might have brought the war to a quick and crashing end, never materialized. Tecumseh was eager to push the fight. But Colonel Henry Proctor, the British commander who had taken over from the slain Brock, was as dull and hesitant as Brock had been brilliant and aggressive. 
Proctor failed to support Tecumseh. Proctor's hesitation bought you. S. General William Henry Harrison time to mount. Counterattacks. As 1812 drew to a close, Harrison destroyed villages of the Miami Indians. Near Fort Wayne, despite the fact that Miamis were non-combatants. And he raided what? Amounted to Indian refugee camps near present-day Peru. Indiana. In January, Harrison moved against Fort Malden, advancing across a frozen Lake Erie. But he suffered a stunning defeat on January 21st at the hands of Proctor and a contingent of Red Stick Creeks. Yet, Proctor was unable to score a final decisive victory. British blockade in frankly miraculous contrast to the dismal American performance on land was the activity of the U.S. Navy. The British brought to bear 1048 vessels to blockade U.S. Naval and commercial shipping in an effort to choke off the nation's war effort. Opposed to this, vast armada were the 14 seaworthy vessels of the United States Navy and a ragtag fleet of privateers. The U.S. frigates emerged victorious in a series of single-ship engagements, the most famous of which were the battles between the U.S. S. Constitution, Old Ironsides, and the British frigates Guerriere. Off the coast of Massachusetts on August 19, 1812 and the Java. Off the Brazilian coast on December 29, 1812. Despite such American triumphs, the British were able to tighten their blockade into a veritable stranglehold that wiped out American trade, bringing the U.S. economy to the verge of collapse. We have met the enemy and they are ours. During 1813, renewed American attempts to invade Canada were again unsuccessful. In the West, however, the situation brightened. William Henry Harrison managed to rebuild and even enlarge his army. So that by late summer of 1813, he fielded 8,000 men. In the meantime, a dashing young naval officer named Oliver Hazard Perry cobbled together an inland navy. Beginning in March 1813, he directed construction of an armed flotilla at Presque Isle, present-day Erie, Pennsylvania, while drilling his sailors in artillery technique. By August, he was ready to move his vessels onto Lake Erie. On September 10, Perry engaged the British fleet in a battle so fierce that he had to transfer his flag from the severely damaged Brig Lawrence to the Niagara, from which he commanded nothing less than the destruction of the entire British squadron. He sent to General Harrison a message that instantly entered into American history. We have met the enemy and they are ours.